you ever been on a, a significant road trip or, or gone with your family maybe on a, a, big, a big road trip? I, I love road trips. They're awesome. You, know, you get to plan them. You get to figure out where you're going to go. You get to anticipate, right? You know, we're, we're going to stop here. And I always wanted to see that. And um, yeah, Road trips can be fantastic. They can be fabulous. You know, until they're not, <laughs> right? <laughs> We, we were, a few years ago, we were taking our, our eldest to university in the States. It was going to be a long drive. Um, we weren't even out of Alberta uh, before the fuel pump on our van went. And um, those of you who are mechanics, you, uh, sometimes they're, they're intermittent. It takes a while to sort of figure out what's going on. What is it? Uh, God was gracious. We got to where we needed to be. Um, yeah, got a repair done and, and then, you know, d- continued on the road trip. Uh, but that's road trips, you know, there's the unexpected, as much as you plan, as much as you hope, as much as you envision, you know, where's this, go- um, and then I think the challenge for us is, is can, we, can we make the unexpected part of the adventure? Uh, can we see in it some of, um, uh, of, of, you know, those of us who are following Jesus, this is some of what he had for me in this window of time. Um, uh, this Sunday, we are taking, uh, we're stepping into the second half of our grounded series as we've been working our way through the book of, of Genesis. Uh, the first 11 chapters, uh, often referred to as primordial history, um, tell the account from creation through to the Tower of Babel. Um, Genesis 1, uh, we, we learn much about God. Um, Genesis 2, we learn much about ourselves. We've been made in his image to represent him uh, and we're to be relational human beings. We're to be in relationship with him uh, as well as in relationship with one another. Uh, That tragic Genesis chapter 3, uh, which we might call the great division, uh, explains so much, uh, as Bill was praying, speaking about the brokenness in our world. Ex- Genesis chapter three explains so much of how that came to be, the great division that exists uh, between human beings and between us and, and God. And, and then Genesis chapter four to nine begins to spell out how bad things got, the depth of the sin problem, to the extent that God washed it all away, uh, washed it all away. Genesis 10 and 11, we find out that though he washed it all away, sin was not gone, gone. Uh, Sin was not gone, gone. Uh, It it wasn't enough just to deal with a few bad apples. The the sin problem was deeper than that. Genesis 11, last Sunday, we saw God's incredible grace at work in the account of the the Tower of Babel. And and his grace was at work in that rather than leaving people on the fast track towards sin, he he disturbed their plans, dividing the people, confusing their languages, creating space and time in which God could engage his plan uh, among humanity. The end of chapter 11 we come to an introduction to uh, Abram. He will become Abraham. Uh, the next, the chapter 12 through 50 uh, will be an account about Abram, Abraham and his family, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and it's this look at God focusing his attention to bring the rescue plan through one family in particular. So this side of the flood, uh, beginning chapter 12, uh, our narrator, uh, I'm believing that, that predominantly this is the hand of Moses. He's introducing us to uh, our, the ancient forefather of the Jewish people, Father Abraham. Uh, and Abram, as he is known at this point in the account, uh, is being invited by God to go on a significant road trip. It's a little bit more complicated than, you know, throw the kids in the van with the dog and a few, you know, suitcases. But let's start with the backstory of what leads us to this. Uh, Because there are some important details that that lead us into the account of Abraham. Um, This is going to be an account of faith. Uh, It's going to be a story about failure. And it's going to be a story about the future. 
Uh, faith, failure, and the future, that's the outline. If you download the sermon notes to the, with the OAC app or if you've got a hard copy or just make some notes as you go along because I'm gonna ask you at the close of this morning, what's God been saying to you? What, what are you hearing him? And maybe you've already heard it in the sermon of song and prayer that we have had. And I'm gonna invite you to attach it to the authoritative scriptures and, and walk out through it. Faith, failure, and future God is a covenant-making God, and he's a covenant-keeping God, and he's inviting you to walk with him in covenant. He's a covenant-making God, he's a covenant-keeping God, and he's inviting you to walk with him in covenant. Let me jump in at Genesis chapter 11, verse 27. I'm in the New Living Translation, um, if you're following along digitally. This is the word of the Lord. This is the account of Terah's family. Terah was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran was the father of Lot. But Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans, the land of his birth, while his father Terah was still living. Meanwhile, Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. Milcah and her sister Iska were daughters of Nahor's brother Haran. But Sarai was unable to become pregnant and had no children. One day Terah took his son Abram, his daughter-in-law Sarai, and his grandson Lot, and moved away from Ur of the Chaldeans. He was heading for the land of Canaan, but he stopped in Haran and settled there. Terah lived for 205 years and died while still in Haran. So this is kind of the introduction to this family, and, and already our, our narrator is calling us to attend to the fact that there are some significant obstacles going on here. In, in particular, there, there's an obstacle of family. Where will our loyalties lie? There's an obstacle of infertility. Um, there's gonna be some promises made, and that's a significant obstacle to the fulfillment of those promises. And then there's gonna be more obstacles with family. Uh, ought not surprise us, a family can be complicated. Uh, here's a map of, the, of ancient Mesopotamia um, where the story takes place. Now, um, you can see sort of Babylonia down on the south toward the Persian Gulf, and, and then uh, Elam and Mara, Assyria, um, Haran. There's a little red line. I don't know if you can see that on the map as you're looking at it, but there's a little red line that goes from Babylonia down near the Persian Gulf up to Haran and then around the Arabian Desert and then down into modern-day Israel. That's, that's the journey. That's the road trip um, that Abram is on. And let me add the caveat uh, that it's really difficult uh, looking at ancient texts and ancient architecture, or archaeology rather, um, to, to, to be 100% sure. Okay, is this the place that they're talking about? Because there are several places in ancient literature that are called Ur. Um, uh, so there are a few theories going on out there depending on who you read. This is probably the most uh, commonly accepted um, uh, expectation of where Ur of the Chaldeans was and, and exactly what this trip looked like. Down southern Mesopotamia, uh, Abram's father, Terah, uh, starts the migration toward Canaan. Now, we don't know why. Uh, the text doesn't tell us what was going on in that generation, uh, nor does it tell us why they stopped in Haran. Now, it's probably not lost on you. Haran was the name of the son that died while they were still in Ur of the Chaldeans. Uh, so it's possible that there's a little bit of you know, anachronism here uh, with the name being applied to the place they stopped in mem memoriam to the sun. Well, we just don't know. It doesn't tell us that. It's all guessing, guesswork, or maybe it's educated guesswork. But, but this is, is the journey that is being described for us. And, and this is where we pick up the story in chapter 12. Listen to verse one of chapter 12. The Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. Now let me just hit pause for a second. This is no small ask. Leave your native country. Leave your relatives. Leave your father's family. These are all sources of security, sources of identity, uh, sources that would, would support uh, the, the growing family that Abram has. And go to the land I will show you. That's a little vague, God. That's a little bit, a little bit vague. Could you, you know, make it a little more specific for me, please? Reading on. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. 
I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed, as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people who had taken into his household at Haran, and headed for the land of Canaan. When they arrived in Canaan, Abram traveled through the land as far as Shechem. There he set up camp beside the Oak of Moreh. At that time, the area was inhabited by Canaanites. And then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. And Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. This is the word of the Lord. Now, now, now it's interesting that God says that he will make Abram famous. That's the same language we encountered last week around the Tower of Babel, except it was the people who were gonna make themselves famous. God is the one initiating the blessing here. And and this is the first of five times that God uh, spoke this promise to to Abram. Uh, Over in chapter 15, uh, the speaking of the promise is gonna take the formalized, formalized structure of a covenant a binding agreement between two parties. But before we get there, Abram has some decisions to make. It is one in particular to make. Will he trust God? So that's a question of faith. It's a question of faith. Will you trust God? We've been singing about it. We've been singing about the unknown, the things that don't make sense in our world, the disappointments that we encounter. I've described faith as being like a living, a living rope. I've got a picture here for you. Faith must have an object. It must be secured in something reliable, the bedrock of God himself. And then the more we use our rope of faith, the more we walk by faith, the more we live by faith, the stronger our faith becomes. And for Abram, a choice was being set before him. Now, now we've seen this before in our journey through Genesis. Choice. Back in the the garden, God gave three amazing gifts uh, to Adam and Eve. He gave the gift of breath, the breath of God, the ruach of God. He gave the gift of choice. You may eat from the fruit of any tree in the garden except the one in the middle of the garden. You may not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The gift of breath, the gift of choice, was the third gift. It was a gift of companionship, for intimate relationship, of not being alone. He gave Adam a wife, he gave him Eve. And the two became one flesh. And they became this partnership in the rigors of life that was this enormous gift. She was the perfect fit, the perfect companion for Abram, uh, for Adam, sorry. And these good gifts are God's gifts that he offers, uh, that he offered to, to, to Adam. And now Abram is being given a choice. It's not an easy choice. Dr. John uh, Walton puts it this way. Abram must decide whether to abandon his land in favor of the land Yahweh offers. He must decide whether to abandon what family he still has in favor of the family Yahweh offers. It's all logic, given his infertility. He must decide whether to set aside his blessing, his inheritance, Fui describes. The initiative offers much, but its cost is significant. Abram must trust Yahweh to deliver what he has offered in order to give up so much that Abram already has to gain. If you want to go on a road trip, will you trust me? It's going to be so much more than just getting the kids into the van, making sure you've packed the right things. Verse four, so Abram departed as the Lord had instructed and Lot went with him. Now, we tend to get to that point in the, in the story and say, right, they've done the right thing. Whew. 
should be good to go now. You ever caught yourself thinking that? I certainly have. You know, we should be good to go now. Everybody's made the right choices. Everybody's made the right decisions. Should be easy peasy. So it's, it's, all, it's all coasting from here. And, and yet, you've probably lived enough life to know that's not quite how it works, and certainly that's not how it worked for Abram. His faith is going to grow through the rigors and the trials that are going to be set before him. There's a principle that, that maybe you want to write down. Difficulties will stretch Abram, and difficulties will reveal God. They will stretch Abram, and they will reveal God. And the first test was leaving the land of Haran. That went well. That went well. Good, way to go. He took the livestock, the, uh, the, the, the servants that had been gathered to his household, and they made their way to Canaan, modern-day Israel. And, and there God met him, and Abram, in response, built an altar dedicated to the Lord and worshipped him. Uh, some would say it was maybe a, a way of sort of staking his claim on the land and build an altar here. Well, well, God doesn't allow us to end with that conclusion at least uh, because God has promised this land to Abram. Nice. So far, so good. Test number one, A+. Plus. Difficulties will stretch Abram uh, but, and they will reveal God. So we come to test number two, chapter 12, verse 10. At that time, a severe famine struck the land of Canaan, forcing Abram to go down to Egypt where he lived as a foreigner. All right, so famine, not enough food, got to do something about this. Livestock's going to die, family's going to die. No problem. We're used to traveling. We've done some road trips before, okay? So we'll hit the road again, and we'll go to Egypt, Better climate anyway, right? Uh, better, uh, better, more arable land, uh, more, resi- more flood, uh, drought resistant. Um, uh, got it covered, got it covered. However, they jump in the van, they're making their way down to Egypt. Uh, and, 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 and Abram looks over to the passenger seat beh- beside him and says, oh my goodness, she is drop dead gorgeous. I'm in trouble. Right? He, he, so we make a mistake if we assume that our assessments of beauty are, uh, were the ancient assessments of beauty, okay? Uh, I'm not saying she was ugly, but, um, but, but beauty is more than skin deep here. She's about 65 years of age at this point, which is really cool. That's some beauty care. Um, she'd been living near the Dead Sea. Uh, you know, there's some mud there that maybe... <laughs> um, so Abram's got this choice to make. He's got this significant problem, and he allows fear to take over, right? There's the promise of God, but then there's the fear of, of, of what might be because he sees obstacles. He sees things looming before him, and he makes a significant error here as he fears for his life, and he tells a lie. Now, you, you might even say it's a little white lie, I mean, she was his sister, half-sister. But it was a lie. It was intended to deceit. He was married to her. (laughs) Um, When you misrepresent the the, the truth of the situation, when you intend to deceive, it's called a lie. Call it for what it is. Confess it. Repent of it. Begin to walk differently. Well, this one could have cost them everything. Remarkably, God spared Abram, I'll have to let you read the account yourself. Uh, And in it, he was stretched and God was shown. He was revealed. Extraordinarily gracious in the midst of a really stupid decision. Now, the next test seems to come immediately. It it seems, you might call it a test uh, around his his wealth. Uh, They're they're out of Egypt. They're back in, uh, in toward the land at least. Abram and Lot's herds have have grown. They've been blessed. This is material wealth for them in those days. So much so that the land could not sustain it all. And so Abram gives to Lot what God had given to him. He gives him a choice. Which way do you want to go? You go one way, I'll go the other. You know, uh, Lot made a devastating choice. He took what looked good on the surface and it nearly ruined him. 
Uh, you can read about that yourself, chapter 14, chapter 18 through 19. Abram passed that one, and, and, and then the next test came along. You, you getting the idea? Life, a series of, of trials that, that, that are going to grow you and are going to reveal God. Next test comes along. It's a test of military strength and maybe um, political will. Can we call it that? Uh, so, so, so what happened, Lot and his family uh, actually moved into the city of Sodom. Sodom was sacked by some foreign powers and, and Lot and his family were carried off as part of the plunder. Amazing they were not killed. Abram has, by this time, he's wealthy, a, a small military band of young men who have some training. They rally a few other powers, city leaders, say, let's go after them. And, and, and miraculously, they succeed against a far larger force, enormous tracts of land that they have to cover on foot. I'm like, man, how did they ever do this? And they bring back Lot and his family and all the plunder. Now, Abram has some military uh, success. Uh, He has rallied some forces. What what, what do you do with that kind of power? What do you do uh, with uh, this, the, the political leverage that this maybe gives? He, he sets it all down. He lays it all down. He passes the test. He, he gives it all, all the people, all the plunder, gives it all back and, and worships God. We were introduced to, to the king priest of Salem, a guy named Melchizedek. We'll maybe talk a little more about him in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and, and Abram lets go of what might have been a temptation to create the nation in his own strength. You know, the nation that God had promised him? To do it in his own strength, to do it in his own way. Another test passed. Third time the Lord speaks to Abram. So there are a bunch of other tests, but I I wanna pause on Genesis chapter 15 because there's something really, really significant. See, it is the third time that God speaks the blessing to Abram. And it's huge for us in several ways. I'm just going to read a couple of excerpts from this. Watch for the God's part and watch for Abram's part. Genesis 15, verse 1. Some time later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you and your reward will be great. Well, this is a little ironic coming right after the chapter where he just had this military conquest and, and showed some, some grit, right? And God's saying, I will protect you. It's not going to be you. It's not going to be the power of your own might. And then Abram speaks to the Lord of his concern that the blessings actually don't mean much at this point because he doesn't have an heir. He doesn't have a son. Um, what do I do with the promise of land if when I die, that's it? You know, what, do I, what do I do with the promise of making a great nation if, if there's no one that's going to, like, this just doesn't make any sense, God blessing that we would be a blessing to all the families of the earth and here's the Lord's response Genesis 15 verse 5 then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him look up into the sky and count the stars if you can that's how many descendants you will have and Abram believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith now this is a statement that's going to be repeated through the scriptures hereafter. Abram believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. What's it mean, what's it, what's it mean to believe the Lord? If I promised to do something for you and you said, okay, it's, it's as good as done. I'm not gonna think about it again. I'm not gonna stress about it. I believe it's gonna be done. You've believed me. You've trusted that I am good to my word. I said it would happen. Good, good enough for me. Uh, Abram believed the Lord. Here it is in in a different translation. Abram believed the Lord and the Lord considered his response of faith as proof of genuine loyalty. Okay, so, so this isn't his belief saved him. He didn't, it isn't his belief made him right with God. Only God can make us right with God. But his belief was necessary 
in order that God might declare Abram to be right. It's a living out of something that only God could do. Something had shifted inside of Abram, and this statement lets us know. A a switch has been flipped. Faith is now present. It is growing as as he puts his confidence in God and leans even harder on the rope. Because despite the things that he's seeing, he's willing to trust God. Do you believe God? Do you trust him? It's difficult. It's difficult at times. We're talking about Abram's faith, and we can't talk about Abram's faith without also talking about God's faithfulness. God's already promised to do something amazing in Abram's life. In chapter 15, it it goes to another level of the promise being revealed. Abram asked God, how can this be true? How can can I be sure of this? Uh, And and God said, okay, here's your part. You prepare some animals. He does that. Some of them are cut in half, laid out on the ground. It looks like a sacrifice. Like it looks like some kind of ancient animal sacrifice things going on here. It's much, much more than that. Because it's at that point that as the animals are laid on the ground that God then takes over and does what he says he will do in this. Genesis 15, verse 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot with a flaming torch passed between the animal parts. That day the Lord made a covenant with Abram. To your descendants I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates River, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. No mosquito bites there today. <laughs> uh, we've been introduced to some of these names as we've been going along, like as we've been reading through Genesis. You know, Moses has been setting up. Who are these people? Where did they come from? So, so, so don't miss, though, that, that God is the fire pot and the torch moving between the parts of the sacrifice. What we're looking at here is a, it's an ancient contract signing ceremony. And, 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 and what's particularly profound is God is the only one signing it, meaning that he is taking the full responsibility for fulfilling this covenant upon himself. How will this be happen? God will make it happen. How is this possible? Everything is possible. The God that we serve, trust, we sing about, and we look to in our moments of greatest joy and in our moments of greatest distress. Abraham had to scare away some scavenger birds. That day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham with Abram. He is the, the smoking fire pot, he's the flaming torch, and he is the one who's taking it all upon himself. Abram's faith was secured in God's faithfulness. And so he chose to believe. God's faithfulness was, mercifully, God's faithfulness was not dependent upon Abram's fidelity. If you've read this account before, you know that Abram's actions didn't always line up with his words. So we need to talk about his failures. We encountered one back in chapter 12. That was the, you know, give your wife to Pharaoh in Egypt thing to save your hide because you think she's so beautiful you're going to get X'd off. There was that thing, chapter 12. The catastrophe. Chapter 15, the signing of this covenant by God. Chapter 16, next chapter. Sarai convinces Abram that they need to help God out in this whole get a child thing. She gave him her maidservant as a kind of a surrogate womb for his child. Now, just hit pause on the story. We have some difficulty kind of getting our minds around this as modern Western thinkers. There's just no question about it. But remember, we are looking back almost 4,000 years, and we are looking across the world to a completely different culture, and it was a culture in that day and age where the, the concept of a surrogate mother for uh, an infertile 
particularly the wealthy woman, uh, was, was not that strange a concept. And there's a couple of things significant going on here. One of them is, in a pre-scientific world, the understanding of reproduction was really quite limited. Like, they knew how babies were made. Um, but they, they believed that the, a woman's womb was really just kind of an incubator. That was just sort of, the, the male was responsible for the child. Now, they knew that, you know, sometimes these kids look like, more like mom than dad. Um, but that was more of a, a curiosity because everyone knows that, you know, the male is responsible for the family line, and this is where it comes from, okay? So there's some pre-scientific understanding going on here. It's part of the justification for how they thought, or how some people at least thought, about the idea of a surrogate mom, a surrogate womb. But there's another thing going on here, and that is the pressing urgency of time. Number one, Abram and Sarai are not getting any younger. They're already, even in the... So in, in the early years of the earth, it seems people lived a long time. Air was fresh, DNA was uncompromised. I think there's lots of good reasons to expect that, that we're to understand that as, as real history. If you don't, that's okay. But after the flood, the ages uh, that people are living get shorter and shorter. Uh, and, and, and so now we get to the place where Abram is 86 years of age, uh, Sarah is about 10 years younger, and, and the whole thing's getting increasingly unlikely that anyone's going to bear a child here. And, and so they have taken matters into their own hands because time is a ticking. But there's another thing going on here as well, and I think we, we often miss this piece. Many years pass between these visitations from God. Okay, now bear with me for a second here. Have you ever read the pages of Scripture and said, I wish God would speak to me like that? Like, like, like it says, God spoke and they heard and then they did. Oh, if I could only have such clarity in, in how God would speak and direct me. Consider this. When Abram was, 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 uh, did what God asked and moved from Haran to Canaan, he was 75 years of age. When Sarai gives her advice concerning how they should help God out, uh, he's 87 years of age. That's when Ishmael is born. Ishmael would become the ancestor of the Arab nations of the world. When Abram was 100 years old, he became the father of Isaac. Now, Abram's name would be changed by God to Abraham, father of many nations. And then by the time he died, he would be 175 years of age. Now, if, if the first time he heard God speak was 75 or maybe it was 74, or maybe it took him five years to kind of get his ducks in a row and actually be obedient, so let's, let's say he was 70. And he died at 175, there's 105 years Recorded for us in Scripture are about eight occasions when God spoke to him. There's a lot of space between those encounters with God. There's a lot of do this and then like a decade of silence. Now, you and I get to hear from God on a regular basis. Like Abram, Abraham, he didn't, he hadn't, God hadn't even given the Ten Commandments at that point. Like Moses would, would deliver those from Mount Sinai about 400 years later. Uh, so, so, so you and I have this enormous privilege, not only this side uh, of Abraham, this side uh, of the Mosaic covenant and the law, the giving of the law, this side of the Old Testament prophets, but this side of the cross of Jesus Christ and then the gospels and, and, and the, the letters that have been written for our benefit and the invitation to come together and worship and hear God's word spoken, read, encountered, and even in those moments when, I, when your prayers feel like they're just bouncing off the ceiling, rarely does it last 10 years or 15 years. And so time was an issue here for some, for some of the things that they were dealing with. 
And we come back and we say, but waiting is so difficult. And absolutely it is. And they knew it and you and I know it as well. Right? We, we wait. We want to hear from God. Well, where should I go to school? You know, who should I marry? Should we have kids? When should we have kids? How should we have kids? We're not having kids. How, how, how do we fix this problem? Where should I work? Will my kids grow and mature in Christ? I'm waiting for this, oh God. I'm waiting for a prodigal to come home. I'm waiting for an inactive one to go out. <laughs> I'm waiting for a broken one to be healed. Waiting for a senior member of the family who seems to be just a step this side of eternity and their graduation into the presence of Jesus. Waiting. We're waiting. And we say, how long, oh Lord? Because waiting sucks and we're rather impatient about it all. But worse than waiting is filling the gaps ourselves and making matters worse. We see it it on full display in Abram and Sarah's life. Adding complications, adding obstacles that God would have to move out of the way before his purposes could fully mature. We've talked about faith. We've talked about failure. It leads us to future. The future. If you're not sick of hearing me say this, then I have not said it often enough, okay? The hero in these accounts, whether we're talking about Adam or Noah, or now we come to Abram, the hero in the the biblical accounts is God himself. He is the hero. He is the one who is at work here. So I say that because I'm gonna read a passage of scripture that many of us read and find really uncomfortable. Like it's a confusing passage of scripture. But remember, God is the one who's at work here. He is the author in all of this, and he is the one who we're learning more and more about his greatness through the difficulties that we are experiencing. And he's at work sometimes through human beings, often in spite of human beings. Genesis chapter 22, we're running forward in the account. Abram, Abraham now is tested again, and it is a tough one. Genesis 22, verse one, sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. I did a little survey this week of some friends who know the word pretty well just to ask the question, uh, what, what do you find the most interesting or the most disturbing uh, account in the entire Abraham narrative? And among the many things that they offered, always what came up was this account. How could God ever ask such a thing of, of Abraham? What's God doing? Who could pass such a test? If he asked me to do something like this, who could ever possibly hope to pass such a test? So let me speak to that. Firstly, God will never ask this of you. We've read enough of the backstory to know that there is something profoundly unique going on here. In Abram, in Abraham, in his day, 1,800 years before Jesus, okay? You will not be asked to be the father of many nations or to be the one through whom the Messiah will come, okay? Uh, uh, We look back on his second coming. They were looking forward to his first. Secondly, this test is for Abraham's benefit. The test is for Abraham's benefit. If you're in school, when you are tested, it's for your benefit. So that you know, am I getting it? is what the teacher thinks I should know, something I do know. The test is for your benefit. And this is for Abram's benefit, Abraham's benefit. Has he learned anything on this entire road trip as he's been making his way? Has has his faith grown, strengthened? And the answer is yes, absolutely it has. 
This was the most severe and grueling test imaginable and he passed. Now, let me say, by the way, God did not let him go through with it. Just in case you haven't read ahead. Okay? Uh, In fact, I would argue that God never intended him to go through with it. There's a difference between the question, are you willing, and do it now. This was an are you willing question, and God will ask each of us as parents the are you willing question. Will you surrender your child to him? Will you allow him to work his purposes in his time through their lives in ways that may at times be really difficult? Or in ways that at times uh, might require us to say, okay, you can go be a missionary on another side of the world and I won't see my grandchildren very often. (laughs) Or or, or you can be an artist. That may be worse. Um, (laughs) But are are you willing to, to, to release them into God's care and keeping that his purposes, even, even when it looks like all you're seeing is rebellion. Verse seven, Isaac says, we have the fire and the wood, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? And Abram's response is profound. It's gonna echo through the, the coming centuries. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. The test was for for Abram's, Abraham's benefit. The test is also for our benefit. Because we know the backstory. We know that there was so much hanging in the balance. We know the mistakes that have been made so substantially. One of of those mistakes would have consequences for the next 3,800 years. But in all of it, God is providing, not just for Abram and his family and their future, but he is providing for you and for me as well. Without Abram's test, We would not have the the, the powerful confession, God will provide the lamb. I don't need to provide it here. That would be the hope that would carry the the, the Hebrew people, the Israelites, through centuries of failure, revival, uh, through all kinds of of ardor, and and would, would carry them to the place where a small group of Jewish shepherds would be on a hillside the night that an angel would appear or angels appeared and said, I have good news. This is going to be joyful. This is good stuff. This is a faithful God bringing a a, a remedy centuries in the making. And we come to realize that the difficulties have, yes, been stretching Abram, and they stretch you and me, and they're showing, they're showing who God really is. We've been seeing God in the pages of Scripture portrayed as a relentless pursuer of good. We see God portrayed as a capable judge of evil, as a faithful keeper of his promises about that more in the next few weeks. God is a covenant making and the covenant keeping God and he's inviting you to walk. You believe him. He has taken the full weight of the responsibility of this upon himself and he invites you to receive the blessings. The new land, a place to belong. A new family, the family of God. A new inheritance that you get to enjoy now and through eternity. God will provide a lamb. John the Baptist recognized him. He said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do you recognize him? Will you trust him? Will you believe God as the difficulties stretch us? We're invited to see God in the middle of it all. There's the daily trust issues for food and shelter, and there's the eternal trust issues, the big ones, my eternal destiny. Trust him with it all, would you? I want to invite the worship team to come. I want to invite you to bow with me, if you would, please. 
Let's not leave this moment without speaking to God about it. Oh God, oh Lord, we, we come to you and we're, we're, we're coming this morning and we're bringing our faith. It's strengths, it's weaknesses. Thank you for enabling us to believe. Help our unbelief, oh God. We ask that you would lead us to securely anchor our faith in you, oh God. We bring our faith. Lord, we bring our failures. You have said in your word that if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just, and you will forgive our sin and make us righteous. Thank you for such enormous mercy. Right now, in this moment, oh God, would you prompt us. Holy Spirit, would you shine the light of your truth into our lives and just bring to mind those things that we would confess in this moment, the sin that is there. Hear us. Hear us. Lord, we bring our faith, we bring our failures, and we bring our future to you. We know that those you have forgiven, you have also justified. And those you have justified, you will also glorify. And so we look to you in anticipation, not just of our today, but our eternity with you, O oh God. Thank you. Thank you for this invitation to draw near.